different than the than the norm and it didn't concentrate on the violence or the gore so much but more of a suspense film more of a build i think with the script it was just you had a good sense of the way the movie would look and feel it was just very kind of fast paced and you know started off spooky and then it just got kind of scary and to, to the point where it's kind of you know almost overbearing Action. When I read the script, I thought there was a really interesting relationship there. You know, the whole arc of the relationship is sort of helped by this appalling stuff that happens to them both. So it was really that more than anything that appealed to me. Not so much getting stabbed and <laughs> all the other stuff. There's kind of this Hitchcock element to it in the beginning. You, you kind of don't know where it's going. Then it becomes sort of like this, this terrifying odyssey. I lived in Colorado right after college, and uh, my wife and I, we, we owned a, a dude ranch, a resort out there, and it was only open uh, four months of the year. And so we had eight months to kind of travel and stuff, and we would drive through New Mexico a lot, which is where I originally set the script. And we would drive by, and I'd see these little rundown motels, and never anyone there, and I would wonder how they're staying open, where else they're getting their money from. So I came up with the idea of what might go on in one of those motels that you see kind of, you know, in the middle of nowhere. Do you think they're closed? Since 1957. Well, it's frightening and it's actually quite real. You know, people get lost all the time. We never know what happened to them. And this was an average couple on the road. They break down and find themselves in a situation that seems unfathomable, but can really happen. You know, you first meet David Namie Fox in a car in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere. And it's very clear very quickly that their marriage is, uh, is, is dissolving. Why didn't you just stay on the interstate? I don't know. I guess I just wanted to make this as miserable as possible, you know? See just how big a bitch you'd be about it. Well, David and Amy's story is like a, a lot of couples that experience a tragedy in their life. They lost a child, and I'm sure they were in love through their whole marriage, but they couldn't repair it. And our story vacancy begins with them driving really toward the finish of their marriage. I didn't get us lost. No, you, you slept for 300 miles thanks to your Zoloft Prozac cocktail. I think that, you know, it's a relationship that isn't going well. And obviously there's a lot of issues that haven't been properly managed in the relationship. And then once the stakes get raised to the point where it is life and death, some of those things just kind of get blown away. and you're left with just that one question of, do I, do I care about this person or not? I guess it could be worse, you know? We could be stuck in that twin bed at your folks' house trying to pretend like we're a happy couple. Most of the character for me is just kind of tied into his relationship with his wife where it's kind of falling apart and you gradually find out that they've lost a son. You know, when I would think about how to play the character, that's where most of my ideas would come from. Never should have gotten off the interstate either. And miss our one last great adventure together. In that relationship, he's the one that's kind of been trying to keep the marriage going. He's the optimist. He is the one that, okay, we're gonna get out of this. We're gonna do it. And whenever, whenever Kate's character, Amy, is starting to crack a little bit, he's the one that holds her together. Close the door! God damn it! Why mess with them? I'm not messing with them. I'm just trying to figure out what they're doing. Hey, folks. Hey. How can I help you? When the foxes come to check into the hotel, they I think they just sort of think he's this oddball character, but they have no idea what they're in store for. Yeah, we'll go ahead and stay here. Thanks. We'll give you two the honeymoon suite for $5 extra. It's got a few perks the others don't. Frank Whaley as the bad guy really helped because he, he's such a fantastic actor and had a really offbeat, unusual way of playing 
you know, our main bad guy, that it, it, it had a kind of hyper real creepiness to it that I really like. With this character, it's a matter of kind of gauging it so the audience never knows from at the very beginning. And even to, as the story goes on and unfolds, doesn't know until the right moment that this guy's completely out of his mind and psychotic killer. But rules are rules. I don't make them. I'm just the manager. And the director and I are, you know, really covering our bases in terms of how we play each moment from extremely subtle to very extreme. You know, I think it was a question of balance throughout, and it was a question of balance with the film, and it was a question of balance with the characters. You know, it's not too cliche or it's not too obvious. Trouble is, Clark's won't be open either. Not this late. Frank plays it right on the line, especially the first time we meet him. He's a little off, but then again, maybe you'd be a little off if you were out there in a motel that's not renting to anybody. You're going to take things a little slower. But his pacing is just to mess up these guys. I guess you don't take dimes, though, do you? Just kidding around. What he brings to this character is, is, is great. I mean, his idiosyncrasies and just the way that he has developed and really embraced this character is very creepy. <laughs> I think that we're headed south. I mean, you know, eventually we've got to hit a... Oh, my God! Sorry. Oh, my God. Ethan was great. You know, he has that great blend of, of being charming and disarming. You just bought yourself a $20 sparkly then. Because every day is 4th of July is at Smalls. But then he can also turn and, you know, has that killer instinct. And that's exactly what the character needed. It's a different character for me. It's not the the normal role that I play. Uh, it's more the bad guy and creeped out. Okay, and set. <laughs> but it's funny, because I really only have one scene scene in the movie, it, it, close to the beginning of the movie, um, where I actually have any lines, and the rest of it, I'm just chasing around Kate and Luke. Got it. He brings an intensity to the film every morning, and he has a passion for everything he does. And it's the ideal circumstance for a director. It's the ideal actor for a director, someone who's just just loves doing what they do. That's good. That's been great, man. Cool. Was... All right, cool. Hey, Ethan. Yeah, buddy. That was yeah, great. Thank you, that sir. Cool. That was cool. That was great, man. Nimrod Antal had just directed Control for Hungry a film that his country thought was so good they made it their choice for the Academy Awards for Best Foreign Film. The magnificent thing about Control is that it took place in a claustrophobic environment of the Budapest subway system. And this movie takes place in a claustrophobic environment of the motel. He has the ability to keep you in a confined area just long enough. And then he lets you breathe. This has to be some kind of a joke, right? I just felt it was really important to believe both of these characters, and that was what was foremost in our minds when we were concentrating on, you know, shaping those performances. We just tried to keep that in mind throughout, that it's about these two people, and it's not about the motel, it's not about the horrible things that happened there, but these, this situation these two people are thrown into. shot the hotel uh, in two locations. The first was here on the Sony lot at stage 15, where they shot The Wizard of Oz. That, for me, was, was always just kind of an adrenaline rush. Yeah, that was the coolest set I've ever been on. And, you know, I've been on some sound stages that were just kind of glorified garages. So it was kind of exciting to, to be on a, you know, a really cool one. They did an amazing job of building this thing. Every, uh, to the very last detail, matchbooks and doorknobs and you know the sink in the back is full of dishes and it's a real kind of motel stuck in time. What my concept was to try to get, I liked the old, like Route 66 and other sort of, you know, if you remember back when you were on your family vacations, the place that had the porticos that you drove under, I liked the overhangs that, you know, you pull up and your dad would go, register and get the key and everybody waiting inside and, and then you would go park in front of the room. I think everyone can kind of relate and I think it's a nice kind of Americana kind of feel. On this, of course, we're trying to make it somewhat scarier. It's darker. Everything gets aged, picked out fabrics to have 
made for other drapes and the bedspreads and stuff that they're brand new, but then we had to make, make get the feel from the 60s, and uh, then we knock it down, we age it. It was an awesome set, and, and being there day in and day out was really disturbing too. You, you know, you'd come out after a, after a day's work and you'd really have to wash off the motel at the end of the day, so it was great. We built the entire thing once again for the exteriors, which was mind-blowing when you would, when you would step out of a stage and see a completely built hotel true to what it was here. So that was really impressive. I've never taken part in anything that big, so it was nice. Close, 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 close in a little bit, close in a little bit, close, 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 boom, that right there. We'll lock it off. The look and the tone and the atmosphere of this film is the film. And early on, Andre Sekula, the director of photography, and I sat down and we started talking about our favorite films and the elegance that we were trying to bring to this film. And we decided a hard palette, definitely a film noir-esque kind of very hard lighting would serve the film best. Well, it was a dark movie. Straight away, what I want to, to achieve, or script want to achieve, a kind of uneasiness of, of, of the place. Andre Sekula who shot Reservoir Dogs in Pulp Fiction, you know, going for that realistic look. As the movie progresses, we get more and more frenetic in our camera movement. We start off the movie with composed shots, with beautiful dolly moves and so forth and so on. And these are shots that feel comfortable. As things progress, you notice that Andre starts to go a little more handheld. And it's very edgy and very subtle. It's nothing that's too rattling but there's something jarring about it, something that makes you just feel a little unsteady. Camera movement is part, always when, you, when you're shooting in small, confined places, you, you try to Im make image as dynamic and as attractive as possible. So uh, camera shakiness was more ap appealing to, to the story. We always wanted to just keep things sparse, and I sometimes just trying to overcover certain things, and he has a, a very calm and, 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 and wonderful way about him that he'd constantly remind me, you want something very simple. That was always a, a good feeling to have, have a creative partner that was there to help you. Is that this room? People are fascinated with cameras and people abuse cameras. People do good things with cameras and people do horrible things with cameras. Everybody today can be a filmmaker and that can translate to something really terrible in the wrong hands. You can take a good idea and make it bad and that's what our bad guy does in this movie. Mason's definitely the, the ringleader, you know, the mind behind it, who turns what we do into a business. You know, they're selling these tapes as snuff films. The snuff films were the first day of shooting. We had eight, eight or nine cameras set up in the room, making sure we could see as much of the room as possible. And we would bring in each individual victim and block out the scene, just get the general movement and, and, and where they would end up. And then we would adjust the video cameras appropriately that, uh, to make sure that we were covering the action. And we let, we, we, we let things roll at that point. You know, and we'd, we, would, we would block through everything, but, you know, we just didn't want to contrive things. It was like, and I'm so glad we didn't because there were so many things that came out of it that were just so sloppy and so, so real looking that it, it paid off in the end, you know, to, to do it that way. I mean, just visually, they were just really nasty looking. You know, just the whole idea of what all of that is, you know, and it's when you see people's faces all squinch up, you're like, ooh, okay, good, we did something right here. When all hell breaks out in the movie, watching Kate and Luke get themselves out of the situation and how they do it is fun, exciting, and played very real. Yeah, yeah we need some help. Some people are trying to kill us. Going for the payphone, I mean, I think it's... That's a good scene, just because it has a lot of action, then it's just, you know, the worst nightmare. It's like going to a house for help, and the person that opens the door is one of the killers. I think it's that kind of thing. I think it's a really, really scary moment. 
to have this to have this person of who's the, who, uh, on the other end at that moment who's perhaps going to save them turn around and say you're going to need to settle down so you'll never survive if you lose control mr fox and you shouldn't be wandering around in the dark by yourself <laughs> It's such a heightened state of being to be in that kind of fear. And, you know, there was a lot of running around also. So we both, Luke and I, felt that, you know, it was, it was a really heavy going movie to do if you're going to do it right. There is this real game that's being played between myself and the mechanic and Luke and, and Kate's character. Because Mason has the power really to, to end it all at any moment. I had to drag him into this, didn't you? Might as well have stuck that knife into his back yourself. The thrill for us isn't necessarily the kill, as it is being able to watch them be terrified, you know, and really torture and manipulate them, and which is kind of gross. It just never stops, and they're just kind of moving along, trying to make different things happen to get out, and kind of, I, I think the audience will be right there with them. Oh, oh, oh. A lot of thrillers or horror movies, you find yourself looking at the screen saying, why don't they just kill him? And what, what I loved about this film is that's answered in that they're making a movie. And the more that they toy with them and the more that they elicit fear out of these people, the better movie they make. There was a stunt scene that required quite a lot of preparation, for lack of a better word, and it was much better than I ever thought it would be. It's very powerful, and you'll never believe the stunt is real. And in the world of CG and, and artificial manipulation, you know, you're, a, lot of, a lot of people get away with a lot of things. This is real. All right, the car moves on, go! Here we go, three, two, one, go! The stunt itself was it was just awesome because you know there's a CG way that you know you could do it and you know a very controlled environment and all of that and then we 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 designed this other concept with using wires and, and these, these computerized wenches and stuff like that where you can basically almost make it like a almost a motion control type of a, of a scenario. What we're able to give to them is to actually physically drive a car at a man, hit the man scoop them up and crush them and collapse them into the front of the car, and drive them through a couple walls and then pin them into the back wall that'll, that he gets crushed into. So that was kind of kind of, kind of fun and I was glad that I was able to bring that to table for Nimrod and, and so he was able to put it in his film and get the, the creative shot that he wanted without CG. guys, those stuntmen really put their necks out, so I got something much better than I ever anticipated. Kate and Luke are very bright characters, and at the end of the day, the reason they survive is because they're bright. There have been a lot of other deaths and killings that have happened at this motel. But the only reason these two survive is that their, their force of will to live and their intelligence and their working together allow them to get out of the situation alive. I think the fact that their lives are under threat saves their relationship. I think they, they find that they work together much better than they thought that they did. You know, the film ends, obviously, a little open-ended, you know that they both live, but we've always discussed that it's great that hopefully people take from that, they're gonna make things work, and that probably if we caught back up with the foxes in 10 years, there would be another child in their life. I really hope that what appealed to me when I first read the script, in terms of it being a complicated and interesting relationship, actually works. I hope that that, that, that happens. Yeah, mainly we just, you know, tried to kind of keep keep it feeling realistic. Yeah, that's one thing I liked is it's not too over the top. It seemed very realistic even while we were doing it. You got the feeling that it was scary and then also the action stuff all kind of rang true for me. 
you're really only good as the people you surround yourself with. And I had a wonderful cast and crew, and it was truly a group effort. So I have, I have only them to thank. That is so good. That's nice. I love it. Perfect operation. Yeah, the full operation. Movies like Psycho, I mean, all of Hitchcock's films, those were the models that we talked about in Making Vacancy. We wanted to do something that was really frightening, really real, was not outrightly exploitative, but scared you to death, gave you a sense of catharsis at the finish, and knowing you just had a fun roller coaster ride for yourself. The other great thing about it is that you know you could you, you know you could drive into a motel like like this at the side of the road and they're all over they line the, the landscape and you never come out you could go into it and never come out this is just something that is possible i, I mean it's not that far-fetched i think you know uh let's see if when you next time you go into a, a small desolate generic motel that you don't poke around to look you don't know who's watching and you don't know who's listening Thank <laughs> you.